In 1975, um, I got the opportunity to go study with uh, Tatsuzo Shimoka in Mashiko, Japan. And I was a, a thrower. I had studied ceramics with Warren McKenzie at the University of Minnesota. And when I went to Japan um, and walked in the studio, one of the things that really caught my eye was this particular technique that I'm going to show. And it's a method of making slabs, but um, it's done without a rolling pin and it's done without a slab roller. And Jan and I affectionately call uh, this set of sticks a uh, pocket slab roller because you can just carry them around, stick them in your pocket. Um, the wood is, you know, you can probably make a set for about a dollar or two dollars. And the way that they're made, the sticks are made, is that you just find a pair of matching pieces of wood and you would take masking tape and wrap it around the center and then the ends. And then depending on what thickness slab you would like to, to generate from these sticks, you would take a, a square and a ruler and make pencil lines on the wood. And they're bound together and you put them on a bandsaw and you cut into the bandsaw to make the, the notches and the sticks. So these are um, a little bit, uh, about a centimeter. These are a little bit less than a centimeter in distance and these are useless I wish I hadn't cut those on the sticks and these are somewhere in between that but some of the sticks that we make might have um, dimensions of, of uh, three quarters of an inch or an inch so if you're making larger pieces you can scale up the thicknesses of the slabs and wedging out or pugging out uh, clay and then wedging it and pounding it into a, a big pile I determine kind of what size the pile wants to be based on the size of the paper pattern that I'm going to cut out of that pile. So for instance, this particular paper pattern, I might um, have a pile about this size. I'm also going to generate a couple of teapot shapes and uh, the paper patterns for the teapot uh, top of the body and the bottom of the body look like that. So I might... Uh, you know, especially try to get two pieces out of a slab as I cut through this. And I start off by taking the sticks and just figuring out what um, notch I should start at. And this is a, a little bit harder than it looks. It's, it takes a little bit of practice, but ha having the sticks face up with the slots uh, up, I just slide the wire out and I usually keep the sticks turned out so that there's a tension on the wire and then you just cut through that big pile and walk the wire down. This is the tricky part. Walk the wire down a notch. And you'll end up with a big pile of slabs. When you pound out all these pieces of clay together, the, the clay has gone through um, several step process to this point. And the, the first step, of course, is that I've run it through a pug mill. And most people that you know use box clay maybe were aware of this, but um, the pug mill, the pug mill screw will leave a, a trace through clay. So this, the screw is putting a trace line through the clay. So very often what you should do is you should take your clay and uh, wedge it or move it around a little bit so that it, it interrupts that screw trace, which translates into S cracks or some kind of cracking in the clay. So this clay is run through a pug mill first and then it's uh, spiral wedged. It's pounded into large lumps and as I pound them out, I'm trying to pound the clay down in kind of layers. This is maybe, you know, six, seven large pieces of clay pounded together so that I don't um, create big air bubble spaces. And um, the other thing that I would do in a normal studio situation would be that I would uh, leave the clay overnight. And by leaving the clay overnight, uh, it, the clay homogenizes and any kind of separations from 
those big chunks of clay being pounded together tend to heal together. Um, the beauty of this, these slabs, in my opinion, anyway, um, and you can see they'll, they'll peel off one right after the other here. But the beauty of them is that they don't have um, what I call curl memory. So as you run slabs through most slab rollers, and new slab rollers are trying to compensate for this, but the, the rollers impart a memory to the clay. So sometimes then when you're hand building, especially with finer clay bodies, you'll get um, pieces that curl in unusual ways or tiles that want to curl up in unusual ways. And that's usually, again, from a uh, rolling pin on one side of the clay or uh, the old type slab rollers had just bit one big roller. Uh, the new slab rollers are addressing that by having dual rollers and things like that. I don't have one. Um, all right.